Okay, so uh, Art DeGroat is a combat decorated retired Army officer and the founder and the executive director of the Office of Military and Veterans Affairs at Kansas State. Um, upon a co completing his doctorate in adult developmental development and leadership, he created the Military Affairs Innovation Center, also at Kansas State University, that focuses on national military level national level military challenges. Art serves as a thought leader, expert witness, and policy advisor to the Kansas governor and the U.S. Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. He is recognized as a pioneer and technical expert in the use of performing arts in service to veterans in transition for the DOD NEA's Creative Forces Program, as well as bringing better adjunctive behavioral health care to active and former military through his advocacy and ownership of medical clinics in the military communities across the country. His research passion is in better understanding the lived experience life event of veterans transitioning out of the military and through his consulting company Invictus Consulting, he has assisted in a myriad of corporate nonprofit community based and governmental organizations involved in veteran transition. He's a third generation soldier and uh, is proud to have had the opportunity to continue to serve in academia and with that fantastic bio uh dr de Groot, we are gonna send it to you and i have your slides i'll get them up um and i'll just share and you just tell me when to flip and i'll flip sounds great well thank you very much jim and carrie um who helped me get this all together and uh and i'm happy to be a part of this um today uh, i very much enjoyed um the, the last of the, the, the last presentation um so this is this this is a wonderful forum and i'm, I'm really thankful for it uh, one thing is that most of my work, uh, I, I have not published uh, any of my work. Uh, I had this, as my bio describes, I, I have this rare opportunity and platforms to to implement and practice what my what I'm what I'm discovering uh, in in near real time. So so I've kind of skipped, and I, I don't have a faculty position, so I, I have no impetus to publish other than I feel bad I don't have a chance to share. With my colleagues, some of the things that I've been I've been I've been working on. So so this forum gives me a great opportunity to to share uh, some of my things. Uh, I just picked I plucked out a few uh, a few interesting slides that I, interesting to me. I hope they're interesting to you. Uh, just just to show a little glimpse of what of what uh, I've been doing or what I think I've I've found or what's inf informing my practice. Um, and and all these slides can be made available to to anybody if they if they desire them. So so. Um, so, so hopefully there's the, they're useful tools or um, for you. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, when I first got involved in in this area of of looking at, I guess I was motivated by my own transition experience. Uh, I retired as lieutenant colonel, so you, you one could, and I re, so I left the military but transitioned to retirement as a, somewhat of a senior officer. So I know I had a lot of advantages. Over over others in terms of I had a pension I had health care for life um, I I had at that point uh, uh, three college degrees so so I know my transition uh, w wasn't as difficult as it shouldn't have been as difficult as most uh, but it's also built around losing my wife to cancer so so I did have a lot of transition issues um, that are common with all people um, so I think my motive of studying this was to understand my own experience. And then, and then, secondly, to to really dig in deep, and 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 see what this uh, this transition is um, all about. Because early on, and maybe still today, it, it's been very challenging. And and one could argue that this generation of veterans uh, has a, and I believe, has a harder challenge of, of transitioning than than previous. Um, so the first thing I did on this chart, and I'm not going to brief it. I'm just going to explain what I tried to do was. I tried to look. I tried to situate the the transition experience uh, within the life cycle of people. Their prior prior military service life, their transition into the military. What happens to them when they're in the military? What's the transition period, and what happens uh, after after tr their transition? And below, you see the assets. So I tried to list what 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 do people bring into each of these stages. I also tried to capture uh, the the temporal dimension, like how. You know, if it takes 10 to 18 months to get into the military, but at the point of this, at, at the point I made this chart, um, it was 30 to 90 days of, of transitioning out from the institution. So, you know, you can see some of the disparities. If it takes 18 months to become a soldier, uh, it, it takes more than 90 days to unwind and become a, a, a citizen. 
again. Um, so this chart just kind of lays that out. And then I just, and I just put right in the center there, this transition and, and how difficult it is and what the costs are uh, from, from some of my literature review. Um, I think uh, that's probably enough said about, about that chart. Uh, one thing I would add, add is there, you notice there is not a time dimension on the transition other than the institutional transition when, when you're getting out of the military um, but I have since come to realize through a lot of study, uh, other people's work, that, that the, the life event of veteran transition, I believe, to fully transition is a three and a half to five year process. Um, that, 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 that is what my experience and my research indicates. So I would, I, if I updated this chart, I would add three to five uh, years on, on, in, in, that, in that red square. So, Jim, next slide, please. Another thing that I did, and I, I made this chart uh, uh, maybe two years after my dissertation. I went back to my literature review. I went back to my practice. I went back to the things I learned. And then I made this chart. I, I tried to link um, some of the lived experience phenomena that I discovered um, in my study to existing social science theory, try, trying to link it. And I did it by putting it uh, in these categories of pre-service factors, during service. It's kind of another part of the life cycle. Um, transition period dynamics, intervening influences, environmental dynamics, and then transition performance. So, so these, were, these were titles that I, I created myself. Um, and, and then I linked under those what these issues were and, and what, what science that I found, what other people's work did I find that was credible and relevant and helpful to understand this, this, this. And in most cases, that that, that uh, those those citations and that those literature there is not about a military community. It's about a civilian community. But but there's a, enough in there that I found that was relevant and applicable and generalizable. So so a lot of these things you see here are works that I continue to go back to. I've been fortunate to make uh, some friends with some of these scholars, particularly. Uh, Fred Luthans uh, and, and the work in psychological capital, and I'll talk about that in a, in a little, little later. Um, I, I met uh, doc, the famous Dr. Robert Putnam, uh, the father of social, social capital theory, um, and how that all works. And, and so I've been very, uh, I've been very uh, thankful, and uh, to have uh, to have been able to figure that figure this part out. It, it helps me very much to link what's already been done in in the other fields uh, to ours. Next chart. One thing, um, this is one example of, of, of an area of social uh, science literature that I thought was interesting was I looked at a little bit into career orientation theory, um, the work of Briscoe, um, Br Briscoe and Hall. And, and one of the things uh, I was starting to look at is uh, what is career orientation uh, for people that choose to serve in the military? You know, we all know it's the less than 1%. And, and we also know that today it's the, less than half percent, which is a, a national crisis of people not wanting to serve. But from a career orientation perspective, I, I, I think from my work and from other literature, I think it, I think it's pretty safe to say most people that join the military would be in that low in that in that lower left quadrant where they they're not they're institutionally driven by they have institutionally driven values over their own and 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 they they submit to to organizational um, directives and they're, they're less self-directed than organizationally directed. So, so I think I think a lot of military people enter into this, this orientation. And then today, I think most of the career fields that absorb transitioning veterans are not in that area, um, unless they're going into big institutions, uh, like al what they used to call allied military career fields. If they're, if they're going into de defense, civilian defense jobs, if they're going into corrections, railroad or some of these big institutions, um, then, then they would find a natural fit there for, the, for their orientation. But I think for the most case, we're really asking our veterans to make a cross boundary move uh, into these other quadrants. And, and so I think they're, they're, they're not well equipped uh, necessarily, which makes their transition a little more challenging. So I just, it's just interesting thing that I, I stumbled on and, and it informs me and, and, uh, today about that. Um, next chart. This is a, a result of my doctoral dissertation. Um, I did a exploratory lived experience phenomenology 
Um, I had, uh, I had, I did eight inter- I had eight veterans. That was kind of a cross section. Um, some been to combat, male, female, um, uh, majority, minority, um, officer, enlisted, um, all army. Uh, but um, I try to get a cross section, if you would, of the general population. Again, in a qualitative dissertation, it doesn't have to be representational. It just has to be, uh, it has to be rich. Um, and, and what happened is uh, I uh, I recorded uh, and and had had uh, transcribed twenty three thousand words of, of very very um, very um, methodologically correct uh, interview questions, and then I used a uh, established three step reduction method to break them down, and I identified what I call twenty three common issues. Um, and those are all the ones in the all listed with with the with the bullets. Um, and these were 23 common issues issues that amongst all of the veterans I've studied in this study, they they almost all had these issues. And and there's a second uh, reduction process that that distills them down into the essence of what those are. And those are the five themes that you see across the top. You know, mindset, socialization, mediation, self realization, and mobility. Um, I struggled with the with the word of socialization because uh, if you look at the social the sociological definition of socialization versus resocialization, you would by definition this should be resocialization because they already are socialized uh, in society as as adults and then and then they're changing. But in this case, uh, you can argue that it is socialization because since the military gets most of their talent from the earliest stages of adulthood. They get enlisted right out of high school and they get officers right out of undergraduate programs. Um, you could argue that they that the military service did not, they, they did not complete socialization into adult civilian life because it was interrupted by their military service, which is a very unique institution, culture, and lifestyle. So, so you, you could say it's a continuation of, of basic adult socialization not re-socializing. Um, so that's an interesting point that I'm still kind of debating in my mind. Um, so, um, so let's go to the next slide. The other thing I tried to do is with those five themes is put them in some kind of relational context and um, you know, not all be equal. Again, this is, this would lend itself to nice uh, quantitative to see which one is causal and which one, you know, the, the whole, the, you know, how they all react to each other, the, the dependency and, and relationship to all these. But this is, this was a, this was not that done that way. I, I, I made it theoretical. Um, but all of it really is central to all the, of those five themes, it's all about mobility. It's about change. It's about, it's about changing oneself, one's mindset. It's about, it's about changing geography, changing careers, changing lifestyles. So, so, so it, it all affects the ability of a, per, of a veteran to move, uh, to move from the current state to a future state. Um, and and so, so I put mobility as, as the most central of the five themes. Um, next slide. One thing I discovered was there was not, or I couldn't find to this day, a, a good social science definition of veterans transition. Uh, a scientifically based one. And so I took a stab at it from my findings and my work to, um, to, 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 to publish this as one of my findings in, in my study. Um, I still stick to it. I, I still, with all my work since 2017, I still think it's sound. Um, it was interesting. I looked in uh, a lot of the military regulations for separation uh, and actually, there really isn't any good, the, the, the military DOD's policies on transition are, are really still written uh, under separation. It is an HR uh, separation from, from, from the enterprise. From, uh, so it, it's, it's, it doesn't really have the, any descriptive uh, literature or anything or tech terms about the process of transition. I also discovered that in the uh, in the early 70s, when our nation was transitioning from from um, from from um, into the all volunteer force uh, from the draft, that they did commission a lot of social science, relevant social science to figure out how do you recruit, onboard, retain, develop, employ 
there was a lot of work done, uh, scientific work to, to build an all volunteer military. But at that time, there was almost zero research done or, or looked at on what do we do when these healthy young people are done with their careers in the military if they stay that long? Um, you know, what, what do we do? What's our responsibility to transition them out? And, and, and so it's interesting that I found historically there wasn't uh, any really literature on that. They really didn't have a plan. It, so it just became institutional separation. Um, and we got away with it, I think, for, for many decades because some literature suggests that about 80 some percent of transitioning veterans of previous generations were absorbed in what they call the allied military career field. It's when we made our own weapon systems. We, we did all our, we had a, a very vibrant uh, industrial sector that hired a lot of military talent. So there wasn't a great need for human capital transition um, because there was places you could do, what you learned in the military could be used professionally in the allied military career field. But this generation by a lot of studies suggests that uh, the majority of our transition veterans today uh, are crossing boundaries and getting into industries that have nothing to do with military. Um, and, and so that's why uh, it's a lot, it's a lot difficult, more difficult um, to transition. Um, and there's, there's good charts and good things on, uh, I, I use uh, the, um, I get the name of this right, the North American Industry Classification System is a great reference to look at the workforce today. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an online site and, it's, and it's, it's from the Department of Labor, but it shows very, very detailed uh, information about the state of, of um, industries, career fields. Um, and, and so I, when I, I talk about them transitioning, the veterans transitioning into the workplace, the workforce, um, and you'll look at where the growth is in jobs and employment and careers, um, it's, it's not where it used to be where the veterans used to go. Um, for example, manufacturing. Um, so um, next chart, please. This is my opus, uh, or I hope it to be. Um, it's simple. Uh, it, the only thing creative about it is how I structured it with other people's work and brought it into kind of a, a, meta, a meta model of other people's work. Um, I, I, my, my doctoral background is in adult development. And, and so I'm always looking at uh, you know, life, life models. Uh, most of them are linear um, for simplicity, simplicity's sake. Uh, but I, I really subscribe to the work of Charles Handy. And, uh, and, and he, his book is like The Second Curve. And, and he's a, a very, I think he's Irish or Scottish. Uh, he's still alive, I believe. Um, but he is a foundational researcher uh, in, in economics uh, and, and uh, other things. But he captures the all living, all living uh, things he, he believes uh, live on a curvilinear model of re reoccurring sigmoid curves. And in his model, the ideal way of transitioning is that the, before the first the curve you're on ends, um, you and you start another one that there is an overlapping period called the investment period with this with the blue star in the middle, and ideally that is where uh, transition should happen. Um, and too often, in the, when it doesn't go go properly, uh, there there is no second curve for a lot of us that that, that just opt out of the workforce, um, or some people ride the first curve into a period so low that they miss opportunity to move forward. Um, so starting with the left, um, um, there's the work of McWinney uh, very well, I think in a simple form, uh, uh, describes the three stage process of joining the military where you separate from civilian life, you transition in, into the organization, institution and the lifestyle. And then there's various levels of commitment, re-enlisting, career, whatever, um, different things you do. So that kind of characterizes three stages of becoming a service member. Um, the work of Ruth Jolly, she's a British sociologist, uh, written several books. She's done an enormous amount of case studies uh, from the British that I think are is, is um, can be generalized uh, to, to all other militaries. And she, she has a three-stage model also. That, that, and I, I use this all the time in my practice that it involves confronting the realization that one's leaving, 
And there's different ways. You, the confrontation could be you're being forced to leave, you're leaving voluntarily, um, you're leaving at, at, after a career, or you're leaving earlier than you wanted. Um, and, and, and there's a whole list of confrontation issues and how you confront your departure from the service affects the, the rest phase, the next couple of phases. Next one being disengagement. And, and that, the challenge is, is that happens while you're in the service. Um, for, for transition to really happen well, the service ought to let you disengage while you're still in. And we all, we all too often know that is not the case. That, um, that, that once a service member an announces their intentions of leaving, um, they're, not treated, they're not treated with as part of the team anymore. Um, they're not given and the resources they need. Um, it, it's not legitimized. They feel bad about it. Most people don't, don't show their cards on leaving until the last minute. Um, or, or they're given assignments where they just work them to the last day. Um, they, don't get, they don't get promotions they were due before they leave or awards. Uh, so there's, there's not a good culture of disengagement uh, still to this day, I believe. Uh, and that stunts um, the well-being and the ability to, 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 uh, to transition. And the last thing is re-socialization. Um, and I put those there. Ideally, those should happen during the investment period. Um, in my case, uh, I, uh, I was a upwardly mobile officer. I was very fortunate um, to get early promotions several early promotions. I was selected for command, but my wife tragically died of cancer in 2000. So for me, if you look at the investment period is where the little green dot is for disengagement. Um, I declined battalion command. I declined upper mobility uh, to raise my daughters. And, and so for me, um, where the second curve intersects, the first curve was my wife's death. And I took a compassion assignment to, to, ru to run the Army ROTC program at Kansas State that turned into a that two year assignment turned into a six year assignment. But in that period, while I was still well serving the military, I was also uh, disengaging and resocializing uh, into civilian life. And in my case, it was into higher education and the other thing and other ventures that I've, I'm involved in. So I was fortunate to actually have an investment period. Uh, and in my case, I didn't put, I didn't decide when it was going to happen, and a life event triggered it. But I had six years while I was in the military to go ahead and, and uh, disengage, re-socialize and, and prepare myself for post-military life. Um, the last point of this chart I would talk to you is back to my friend, Dr. Fred Luthans, University of Nebraska. Uh, he's one of the co-founders of the uh, psychological phenomena of psychological capital. Um, and and, and it's, it's self-efficacy, hope, optimism and resilience. Um, this work has been applied, they're applied with NASA right now with astronauts to see which ones have enough psychological capital to go for, for long duration, um, times in space. It's been applied to a lot of other fields. And, and, and Fred said it's incredibly uh, um, relevant for military transition. And I, I agree. Um, what I think is interesting about, about psychological capital is, and we, we, we're, we're usually human capital, social capital, physical capital, but we, we don't hear a lot about the psychological capital. But um, this, this uh, Unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, is, is state-like, not trait-like. So at some point on the left side of the curve, when a soldier is in the commitment stage uh, in their military life, if you measure them uh, objectively, uh, empirically, they would probably be, a, well, they, they would have high scores on those four dimensions of self-efficacy, hope, optimism, and resilience. You take that same person who is now uh, struggling in transition, and you will find that if you, if you t have them take that um, that that assessment, uh, you will find them scoring w way low on, on those four things, which suggests that self-efficacy, hope, optimism, resilience are very, very um, uh, instrumental psychological states that help or hinder transition. And uh, and that is a it, there, there were, those are self-report surveys with with you know empirical items. Uh, so I always when I'm working with people, I always ask them, uh, and I, I don't have the pre. I don't know when they were at their highest, but you, but there's but you can figure out that they're low in these in these, and that is not a good period uh, to trans to make any kind of life transition when when you don't believe in yourself, you're not hopeful, you're not optimistic uh, about that that things are going to work out, and then when bad things happen or non things happen, you're not resilient to keep trying or overcome. Um, 
fortunately, I believe that um, that you want those in the investment period. Uh, if you link it, um, it's, it's, it's essential to all stages, but, but I think that's a missing ingredient uh, at, at, at the psychological level that people are, are, are veterans in transition are at a low point of those, of those states. And, and that is, that does not help even, even when, even when given help, institutional help or mediation, um, that they can't help themselves because they're not in a good state, um, to, to, to receive and incorporate the assistance. Um, I, I, side note, I, I mapped my entire, I remapped my entire life on this. And I'm, I'm on my third, I'm on my third curve, um, in 61 years. So it's, it's helpful, uh, to kind of look at your life this way. And I, I have, I have a blank chart of this and I use it when I'm helping individuals. I'm coming, I'm coaching people in transition from four star. I'm, I'm coaching two four star generals that just retired, uh, eight months ago. And, and I had them re reframe their, their careers using this model. Um, so, and they find it very helpful. Next chart. One thing that I wasn't intending to study, uh, but but it just came out in all those interviews, uh, was this pervasive condition of stress that the vet transitioning veterans uh, were under. Um, I, I I looked at it as a condition, not not as a factor, but and I was surprised at at how stressful and, and stress is relative to each person. Um, so what I did was I, I looked a little bit, I just took a side excursion in, into, into stress and I, and I found the Holmes and Ray social readjustment rating scale, uh, which interestingly uh, is in sociology. I think it, it is still to this day, a very, very sound instrument. Um, and, and their first study was, I think with 3000, uh, sailors in the Navy. Um, and what the scale does is list the 43 um, major life events that people go through that cause a social readjustment. Uh, and it rank orders them in terms of severity, one, one being the most severe uh, to 43 being the least severe. Um, and, and I took that and they also had, they also have, you see on the bottom of the scale, it says if there's a combined, in, in, in a one year period, if someone's going through a series of these and if you add up the, uh, the, the, the value of, uh, of how stressful it is. If it's, if it's 300 or great or greater, they're at, they're at great risk for physical and mental illness. Uh, and you can see the, re the rest of the scale there. So what I did first, I, I took, I took my eight, uh, subjects, participants that I studied and, and I, I went through them and, and mapped them at where, what they were going through in their, and their peak year of transition. Uh, and I found that the average one had 361 life change units of stress. And if you look, if you look at the scale, that, that would suggest that almost everyone that's going through veterans transition, uh, it, it, it is, it is an unhealthy phys physiological, physiologically and, and mentally, it is an unhealthy, uh, experience, life experience, um, and, and, uh, interestingly, if you look at the scale, there's not, you know, um, they have career transition, things like that, but there is no, um, there is no military transition as, as a life event. And this might be fresh, would suggest it is such one, it is such a strong, um, thing. It should be on, it should be on their chart. Um, so again, I use this too. um, what, when I ask, uh, when I'm working with coaching or, or working with people or, um, or working with organizations that, that are, that are attempting to help people, I say, you have to do a survey. You got to figure out where these people are at. And it's not just, a work transition, an occupational transition, a lifestyle. There's a lot of other things that leaving the service has caused, and it'd be helpful to figure out what else on this list is going on in that person's life um, that that's making transition uh, even more difficult and stressful. So, um, so again, I didn't I didn't attend to research stress, but I, I couldn't walk away from it when I found out that there was something unusually stressful about this. Maybe perhaps more than other. Uh, other other stages of the veteran's life. Um, basically, that's that's what I wanted to share uh, today um, in terms of transmitting uh, some of my my work. Um, and I was hoping that we could have a conversation uh, or clarify or anything at this point. Um, Thank you very much, Art. That was. Uh, um... 
wow, I saw I saw some pieces of my life in that <laughs> in that trend. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, yeah. I, I want to ask a quick question, and I, so I'll start it. But we're going to open. I'm going to take my prerogative. Uh, so you went back to the. Oh gosh, now I have to go back to which chart you were on. But you were talking about this this career orientation model which puts people on a value, their own values versus uh, institutional values. And then on the other side, self-directedness versus kind of being directed. And I find that really powerful, putting the military in the lower left quadrant, yet most careers, at least now, uh, or, we'll put it into careers, are not in that lower left quadrant. Most careers are uh, own values driven and most careers are self-directed yes um I, I found that very powerful and i just maybe if you can comment on has that changed when um when you know that was even done in 2006 but even if you go back maybe to the part where you started to talk about all volunteer force and and the expectations that veterans would go into military type careers or big bureaucracy careers my wife often tells me i'm an organization man and yeah. uh, I work better in a big organization that tells me where I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to do. And, um, it, you know, it makes me think, is that because of my socialization in the military and my comfort with the bureaucracy or uh, how, it, I don't know where I'm going with this, but could you just comment on that uh, that model? And I can put the chart up if it's helpful or. Um, sure, yeah. I. Um... There's, there's a lot of different perspectives, you know, why, why is it that way? If, if that is true, what, you know, why is it that way? I think historically, um, I think, well, I think I'll go for it this way, the nature of work has changed. Uh, in, in the, in the, for this generation of veterans, uh, the, the nature of work has changed. Um, um, so so I, I, I think, I think that's made the transition harder because people that are oriented at that like, that like institutionally driven career plans, they know where they stand. They 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 know they they know what the next step is. They know they don't have to they don't have to make decisions on what what schooling or skills do I have to reskill myself for the next level. It's all mapped out. Career paths are mapped out. Um, you have you have career managers at every level that are, that are assigning you uh, to to the positions of higher responsibility and skill level. Um, and, and so um, it's a very mediated career uh, that obviously doesn't exist almost anywhere anymore. Uh, it's all it's protean and and it's it's uh, crossing boundaries. And you decide if you want a promotion, you need to leave company X and and try to get a job with company Y, and they're and, and they're going to hire you at a higher level. There's no there's no upward mobility in a lot of organizations. And we went from a HR world to a talent acquisition world. The workplace is now a talent acquisition model that has defined skill sets. They bring, they hire the talent, they bring it in transactionally, they use it. And if they need new skill sets, they, they, they get somebody else. So, so they don't, there's no development. There's no more corporate in the seventies and eighties employers, uh, midsize and even small businesses. They, they had, they had corporate training. They developed their people. There's upper mobility. They wanted you to, to save for 20 years and get the gold watch. Uh, they don't have any of that stuff anymore in the talent acquisition model. Um, Gallup did a great uh, study. Uh, they do it every couple of years, I think. It's called the state, it's the, the state of the American workforce from Gallup. And that, that I actually put together a, a, a workshop I've consulted with major Fortune 100 companies on their transition program, the recruiting program, uh, bringing people in the, in, into them. I've worked with uh, Edward Jones, Stantec. Um, um, I've got. I'm soon to start with Amazon. Um, but uh, but I've used the the Gallup um, State of the American Workplace Workforce Study to show the differences between that and and you and I made a, a big chart that shows how how the military does it this way and the state of the work of course, does it this way and how different they are. I try to map those two comparatively. And, uh, and then that shows them what they need to do, whether they need more onboarding or they need to understand. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that explains a little, quite, quite a bit of it. Um, that this, this, the state of the workplace has changed and, and, and institutionalized, uh, you know, 
military service is looked at psychologically as a pervasive identity that one that one doesn't doesn't lose the rest of their life life course. Uh, if you had been a soldier, marine, whatever, um, that becomes a pervasive identity, and and, and it, it's it's in there somewhere. You know, a lot of us that transition well have it on the inside. Some are still some that don't transition well uh, are still wearing all their veterans clothing. Uh, I went and saw uh, uh, I went to an event and I saw a, a retired gentleman. And, and he's wearing a business suit and he actually had his military brass as if it was a class A uniform he, uh, uh, on his suit. Uh, you see a lot of veterans driving around with, uh, with all these things on their car, almost like their, vehicle, like their military vehicle, like almost like bumper numbers, their name in the windshield. Um, so, so I think you can tell a lot of folks that don't transition uh, just by how they look. Uh, they, they haven't found an a, a, a internal way. So they're still living an external life of, of an identity of, of the military. And the second thing that's, that's, that look, needs to be looked at is, is the effect of institutionalization. Um, um, since the military is an institution unlike, unlike others, um, um, you know, what is the lasting impact? I, I looked at a few uh, comparative things. I looked at uh, people that are incarcerated, like if you have like a life sentence, you lived in jail for like 40 years, uh, and then you get put out on, on, on parole after 40 years in prison. Uh, some of the caseworkers go over to their little apartments and, and see this perfectly made bed. And they see a, a, a thin blanket and a pillow on the floor next to the bed. They're so used to sleeping hard that there's comfort in that. And they don't want to change. There's a perfectly good bed now in freedom, but they're still choosing to lay on the floor. Um, uh, hard sleeping is, is a social phenomenon. Um, that's predicated on, on institutionalization. Um, so I found a lot of examples where other people that are institutionalized continue to live that way. And, and in some cases, it's a strength and an asset. And in, and in other cases, uh, those institutional practices can be a, a barrier, inhibit uh, people from moving forward, crossing a boundary and so re-socializing into, so, uh, into a different way of life and work. Um, so, so pervasive identity and the, the long-term effects of military institutionalization. Um, and both of those, you know, if you look at the life course of adults, th that period when you're in their, their first period as an independent adult, away from your family and friends, uh, in, in the workplace, independent, that is, that is a very pervasive period of one's life where all things that happen in that stage of life have a, tend to have a pervasive thing. I'm very flexible now in my sixth decade. Uh, but at my point in my 20s to 30s, uh, the things that happened then really set me the rest of my life. Uh, and I stick to those things uh, because they were they were profoundly important then. But now I'm more more flexible. And so, so I think the fact that we get military people at that stage of life, when we give them a pervasive identity and we institutionalize them, uh, I, I think that is uh, that is the case. Uh, thank you. Um, I, yeah. So we'll go to questions. I think the first one that raised hands was Curtis. So. Hold on, let me unshare this too. Curtis, you're up. Uh, hey, thanks for the presentation. That was great. Um, the thing you just said about the hard sleeping is uh, uh, Sam Wilson says the same thing to Captain America. That's how he gets him to go into uh, uh, the counseling. So I thought it was really neat. Anyway, uh, I was curious for the pre-life or uh, pre-service uh, factors. Did you... Did you go through like uh, a family connection to the military service and how that affected whether or not they went in and then how that also played out on the back end? Kind of like the whole warrior class that we keep hearing about now. Yes. Um, yeah. And I know the, the RAND study identified a couple of years ago, what, like, uh, 79 percent or 80 some percent of people that serve today. Uh, it's a family business. Uh, so yeah, I did look at that. I, I look at I looked at that, and I usually I looked at it from um, the perspective of social reproduction theory, and it's not just in the military, but but if you were born in West Virginia and your grandfather, your father were coal miners, there's a pretty good probability that you're going to end up in the coal mine, whether you want it or not, uh, or you may leave, do something else, but but you may come back when when it when it does work. So so social reproduction theory. Um, it kind of accounts for, for, for that in a lot of different fields, not, not just military. Um, and I do believe there is a warrior. There is a warrior. I do believe there's a warrior class. Uh, I, I really do. Um, 
And I think there's family, I think there's also, there's, there's a knowledge. I, I think so, so many people today have no idea what the, what military service really is. Just while they're getting their news, they're getting their information about, because so few people know someone who has served that, that they're getting their information from, from movies where everyone's a superhero and they're like, well, I'm not a superhero. I can't join the Marines or everyone's a victim. Uh, and everybody's going to be broken by the experience, uh, which, which, which we all know is not, the, neither of those are the truth. So, so I think a lot of it is the people that do follow their family in that it's not just there's family pressure to do it. I think they know what the enterprise is and they know it's valuable. Um, I knew I wanted to be in the military. I didn't want to be in it for a career, um, but I knew I would never, I'm the first generation to go to college, get a baccalaureate degree. Uh, I, 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 so, so I got ROTC scholarship. I got two master's degrees paid for by the military and I got my doctorate by, by my GI bill. Um, and, and, and so, so I, I knew military was good for me, uh, um, but I only wanted to do it four years and do something else. But then I fell, I fell in love with it. So I, I had family pressure to do it. Uh, I knew what it was. Um, and I knew at that time it was a great place to start for whatever I did. It was a, it was a great place to start my, my adult life, my career. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I think uh, all those factors um, explain why people that do choose to serve, serve. All right, uh, Hira, you're next. Hi, thank you. I was very curious about, and I, because you, you had it pop up a couple of times, you know, the disability piece of service. And obviously, you know, again, not everyone's going to have that, but I work a lot with those who are getting MedCept um, and, you know, really going through those VA rating process. And when you're looking at that cycle, I'm just curious, in both in your study um, and then as you're working with veterans now, how that's integrated in where maybe that disability identity and adjustment is factoring in on on their kind of their placement and and self through all of that. Yeah, um, s- several ways to answer that question. Um, the, the role of disability in transition um, from an economic perspective. Um, military pay and compensation and benefits for this generation are the highest comparatively they've ever been. And and the civilian equivalent of of their talent in the civilian marketplace is a lot less. So just like the retiree, when when I retired, uh, I took a $40,000 pay cut from active duty 05 to to mid-level administrator university. But I had a $48,000 uh, paying out pension from the military uh, that made it that, that kept me at the same level. Uh, I think a lot of people are, are looking at disability as that cushion, whether they're whether as a financial cushion for taking that the, 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 the entry cost of, of in, entering into civilian life, where most people look at military service as as absenteeism from the workplace. If you went from high school to the Marines for seven, 10 years, most employers say you have never been in the American workplace. You've been in, in, in uniform military service, uh, which is wonderful. And, it, and it's val- I mean, they, they know that it, it, it's, it's valued, uh, but it's not the same thing as 10 years experience as a project manager uh, working for Google somewhere. Um, so, so I think disability has an economic value. If you look at the data from uh, if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics and you look at the, the VA has uh, factors and, and it shows that I think 60 percent or, or 60 or 70 percent disability rating is kind of the cut line between uh, whether whether it affects your employability or not. People below, I think, 70 um, percent are very active in large numbers in the workplace. You know, most of our jobs are knowledge, jo- knowledge working jobs. Uh, um, so, so I, I, I think disability is is not a, generally is not a barrier for those that have some level of disability, but they're still capable of ha- having gainful employment, career or careers, and and, and lives. Uh, um, and then those that aren't uh, have other pro- they, have, they get more disability, they get more things. Uh, because uh, they recognize that they can't, uh, they can't sustain themselves because of the nature of their of their injuries. Um, I also had a conversation with the, the two former uh, secretaries of the VA and and about healthcare stuff. And he says, you know, there's because because the the disability 
rating is also has is, is determination on compensation. That there's 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 no incentive for someone that a veteran that that got well to say, well, I was 80% disabled, but now after all this treatment, I'm three years later, I'm now about 40%. No one wants to raise their hand because what they're gonna do, they're gonna cut their check in half. So there is no incentive to for veterans to admit that they they have gotten better or they're getting better. Um so I think that plays into this. And I, I think I have friends that I've served in combat with, uh, and I chose to get to take zero disability when I retired. And my friends chose to take a hundred percent and I was with them in the same battle. It's a choice, but I see my friend having to somewhat live a lie. He knows he's not hundred percent disabled. He knows he can work. He doesn't want to. And now he has a lifelong excuse and, and lifelong compensation with the government. So, you know, I don't want to call people out on that kind of stuff. I don't do that. Uh, that that's a choice. I mean, you, you, you earn, you, you serve and, and we all, we all come, we all serve. We all come out a different person. Um, I have aches and pains and anxiety disorder. I have all, all kinds of things, uh, but I have healthcare. I treat it. I'm taking care of myself. Um, but I, but I'm not identifying myself as a victim um, because that stunts my ability to move on and continue to do meaningful work careers and be happy and be, and be a great role model of veterans. We're not all broken. So, so I, I think the fact that we're becoming very, very liberal, uh, in, and I know this, this is true too. Um, another factor is right after, I don't remember which, which years it was, but, but there was the big drawdown after Iraq and Afghanistan was, was peaking. Uh, and there was a congressionally mandated downsizing of the force. And, and there were so many people in the queue for, uh, for behavioral health uh, evaluations that they, they ended up medically, and unemployment rate was so high, uh, that population. So, so they started using medical, medical retirements as a faster way to get people out. And if you're medically retired, you don't come up on a, a, an unemployment statistic because that's the retired is not considered, even though you're making money way below an average salary, a living, a living wage with that. Um, um, so I think that put a lot of people out. The other of consequences is we have so many people that are disabled, like, like the entire population of post 9-11 are all disabled, basically. Um, I have not found another person in the post 9-11 world that has that, that opted out of the VA and disability than myself. So, so maybe, you know, I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. And I should go back and actually do it. It was it's a crazy decision on my part. Um, but anyway, I, I hope those are some, some answers to what you're, what you get, what you're, what you're asking. Uh, Micah, you're up. Sorry, my computer's being difficult. <laughs> um, I, I, I have a, a question I asked. I just want to push back just on one thing. You know, I, I definitely agree that, um, I, th I think there is this culture of um, disability and being disabled and having that kind of as an identity as you get out. Um, and I, th I think people definitely abuse it. Um, but I would definitely push back and be careful because I definitely think there are people who need it and who who have it based on disabilities, whether they're wounded in combat, um, based on um, how well they interact with their own PTSD versus other people. So I, I think there's definitely a spectrum um, on that. But the question I wanted to ask actually has to do with something you said early on. You said that um, veterans tend to transition between three and five years. Um, can you speak a little bit more to that and talk about one, what, what, are the, what are the categories that they transition with? Like what, what qualifies somebody as being tran transitioned for one? And then talk about kind of this linear model of, of transition, because I, I think it's interesting, and I'm not saying it's wrong. I think it's interesting because I've always seen transition as well as, you know, maybe linear, but also as kind of a momentary thing that there are times that we transition from the military um, and certain military identities based on the situation that we're in, almost more of a rhetorical aspect to it. So I, if you can just speak to that just a little bit. Yes. Uh, let me just uh, clarify, too, that I, I am not anti-disability. Um, I, I mentioned last year I got to, uh, in my bio, I got to 
the privilege of speaking uh, truth to power by testifying in written and and uh, for, and uh, and live to the U.S. Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, and uh, and 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 I was presenting with the VA. The VA presented also at that hearing, and and the, when the VA didn't, answer, so, so I am very pro um, disability people getting recognized and evaluated. Um, um, I, I I don't like the idea that 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 it affects that, that they can't admit that they're getting well, uh, that they have to sustain. They have to live that I'm disabled in order to keep getting the money that they're, they're fearful that the VA will take their benefits away. Um, so, so I, in my testimony written, it's online. Uh, you can get it. Um, no, I, I, I am very much, I don't speak these issues that I spoke with. These are the human life events of disability I was talking about. Publicly and institutionally, I, I am pro-disability. Um, so, so I want to make that clear. Um, your second question on 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 the on, on the three to five year, like like the duration, like what's what are the gates in there, or or uh, what, what's exactly the question on on the, on so the what, what classifies if it's three to five years that you're completely transitioned? What classifies a veteran as being successfully yeah. transitioned? And then that's why I was the thing that I kind of pushed, not really pushed back on, but just something you could speak to because I've always seen transition as a momentary thing that I transitioned at specific times. Um, and during specific situations, as opposed to having a list of successes after the military yeah. transition. Yeah. Like, well, for first example, of all, the transition is, is a successful transition is, is really a veteran leaving the military and, and, get, and getting themselves in a position of life where they want to be. So it's, it's, it's individually defined. But if you look at a lot of, uh, and I like to comparative things, if you look at a, a marital divorce, there is scientific literature that says both parties go through this process. Yeah, the divorce was done on this day, but but the 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 the, the, the new social bonds made uh, when when you lose half your friends, the new economic life of living as a divorce, uh, your role with your children, uh, how you affects your work because you have you have joint custody. So if you look at all these major life transitions, there set, tends to be an average window from start to somewhat finish. The finish is, is, is really defined by when that person thinks they're back, they're back on their feet, they're thriving again. Um, they, they, they're not dealing with these issues. So it's, it's not an exact science that in year five, but it's, it's the interesting point of that, of, that, of that research finding is that it's not something that happens as fast as we think. Uh, we continue every day to transition. Uh, it took me, the happiest thing that happened to me is when I got my title back. Uh, I left, I retired in the military in 2006. A decade later, I, I went from Colonel DeGroat to Mr. DeGroat uh, at Fort, when I go to Fort Riley for business, for, for, for work. Uh, and then, and then, then I became Dr. DeGroat 10 years later. And now, I, now I have a title again. I didn't realize how much titles are important to me. That my I just finally got used to being art and being myself. So that that transition of me of my personal identity to the public, how I want to be seen in the public, that and people to, to refer to me professionally. Um, so so I would tell you, ten it took me it took me like eight years. It took me ten years to realize that okay, the title was important to me. That's something that a transition issue that's important to me. And and I, I like I like the the, the, the customer respect, particularly that I work with the military. And just being Mister, uh, no one pays attention to you um, like they used to. So there, I think there's an example where a personal example where there's a lot of aspects of the personal transition that takes a lot of time. Um, and, and so I would consider myself, you know, well transitioned, um, but I wasn't for many many years. Um, I was not well transitioned for, for many many years. Um, but but I, I, I am thriving again. As I did in the military, um, I, I I have if I look at my my, so, my uh, psychological capital scores are higher than they they were ever. Um, I am hopeful. I'm optimistic. I'm resilient. I believe in myself in, in a whole new way. I reframed all that. That took a lot of time and a lot of effort. Um, I, ho I hope that answers your question to, to some degree. So we got time for. Uh, well, do we have two more hands raised? So let's do those two more. Michael, you're up. And, and 
Uh, Dr. DeGroat, your your um, talk here is just so informative, and I appreciate you bringing up the fact that uh, for a lot of veterans, the you know there's no incentive for um, you know, saying that they're getting better. And I'm a uh, a PhD student, and this semester I'm actually uh, interviewing quite a bit of uh, different nonprofit organizations who are uh, providing mindfulness based. Uh, services to veterans. And uh, in my interviews, one of the things that one of the common themes is that uh, they talk about how difficult it is for after veterans go through breath work, meditation, yoga, and all these different things. It's, it's, you can see the improvement, but yet uh, they're like, well, I'm not going to really tell you how much I improved because I don't want it to, you know, I don't want to admit that I'm, I'm, I'm better. Um, and for me, it's it's this is an interesting journey because I'm actually uh, just recently transitioned myself. I retired last year, and I spent my entire adult life uh, in the military, in the army, and so it's it's I find myself at this this interesting crossroads, and uh, I'm thinking a lot about uh, self identity. And uh, as I sit here now, and I, I recognize I have these goals and ambitions, but yet. Uh, maybe there's still a part of me, like this 18 year old version of myself that I kind of, you know, uh, maybe didn't reconcile with, you know, and, and this 18 year old uh, person in me is still like, well, let's just hang on the couch and play video games today, you know? Yes. Um, and, and so it's it's interesting. I think the the this topic of self identity, and I, I just kind of wanted to maybe get you uh, get your 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 take on that a little bit more because I know you said for a part of your dissertation was that that self realization um category and and self-identity and and you know i'm wondering you know if you have any other thoughts or things that you can maybe offer up on that and and yeah I'm curious too is to, in terms of like what more maybe we could do uh to to really get younger folks who are thinking about joining the military to to start looking at the topic of self-identity and understanding who they are maybe perhaps before they even come into service yes um It is, there's a lot of variables uh, about that. You know, at the stage of life when you join the military, I mean, we don't have a great sense. I mean, right out of high school or right out of college, undergrad, we don't really have a great sense. Most people don't have a great sense of who they, who they are at that point because we're going from an adolescent uh, or, or young adult uh, uh, that, that's living with family, community, working, whatever, um, and then, then joining something larger. And, and, and so, um, so then the question is, if you didn't really have a great sense of self-identity when you went into the military and the militarization process is, uh, you, you know, Marines don't have name tags on their, on their, on their battle fatigues because you're a Marine. It just says you use Marine Corps. Your name, your identity doesn't mean anything. Um, but then it does later on. Um, so I think the militarization process uh, is, is stripping identity and, and implanting uh, a military warrior identity. Um, and, 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 and all of our, uh, on our uniform, everything shows if you're of combat, you've got a patch on the right side. If you don't, you don't, uh, if you're a ranger, you have that. So, 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 so the, your identity is, 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 is worn on your clothes and your, your self-identity. Uh, and then you just, you live, and I think there's a self, there's self-fulfilling prophecy, I think in the military, in, they have the big principle of demonstrated potential. Um, I, I, I think the military tends to give us st social status and then make it, then we have to grow into it, you know, the fake it till you make it. Um, so I think a lot of that is, 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 is we're trying to create our own identities in the images that there are the roles that are given to us in the military. And then once the, the, those don't exist, or you find out the roles that you identify yourself by someone else's role expectation, and now you're independent. And you have to sell yourself to an employer. You have to make new friends that aren't in the military. Your, your social identity no longer really is your calling card. It is who you are. And, and if you hadn't had a lot of time, and I, I think that's part, back to the other question. I think that's why it's a three to five year process. I think the self-identity is the part that takes the longest. Um, and if you don't have a good sense of yourself, I mean, how well are you going to do on a job interview? Uh, and when you say, well, tell me who you are. Uh, I also noticed there's a gender issue, a difference here. Uh, I noticed, uh, I noticed generally all, all science points out that women have a harder transition than men. Um, but I also, 
indi indicators, but not in the identity uh, side as much as males. I think most males, I if you say, who are you? We, we, we use the average guy. If you meet somebody, you say, who are you? They'll tell you what they do, what they do, not who they are. We don't know how to answer the question. Who are you? You know, I mean, oh, I'm a nice man. I am a this. I mean, I'm like, oh, I'm a, you know, you know, I, I'm, I'm a soldier or I'm a professional. I do this. I do that. I'm a business owner. Uh, men describe who they are by what they do, not by who truly who they are. We don't, we don't have an internal narrative. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, I'm no expert on, on self-identity, but I know it's a huge factor in the transition. Um, a very huge factor, as, as you us identified. All right. So uh, we have reached the end of our hour and I already see Ben just dropped a I'm uh, sorry about that, Ben. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Art DeGroat. We appreciate that. It was uh, super informative and um, I'm gonna spend a while contemplating, You know, like I said, where I am on that chart. I'm not exactly sure anymore. Let me uh, ask a couple of things of the group here. Please share that the Veteran Studies Association exists and that we're having these events. Um, I want to highlight next month, we're having two speakers from the Veterans Health Administration, the Innovation Ecosystem at the Veterans Health Administration, a fantastic uh, organization that's attempting to push the VA in the direction that um, for the future rather than focused on the past. And so they're going to give us their pitch about what they do at the office and then some specifics about some of the work uh, that they've done analyzing segmentation in the VA. And then let me end on uh, the fact that if you haven't seen it, our Veterans and Society Conference is scheduled. So March 14th and 15th, 2024, will be at the University of South Carolina. Uh, and we will have a call for papers. We're looking for your input, your ideas, uh, and your uh, fellowship at that event. So mark your calendars now. It should be a, a great event. Um, with that, uh, I think we call it a day and we'll see you next month. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Art, Jim, before you go. Jim. Yeah. You said that, um, I think you had said something about um, making those slides available, if we could connect.